So you want to create data packs in a familiar programming language with proper IDE support, including syntax highlighting, autocompletion, linting, inline documentation, and generate data packs in under 100 milliseconds. Then this video is for you. I want to show you everything there is in Object D, my Dart toolkit for doing so. Hello, welcome. My name is Stevetus, maintainer and creator of Object D, a library for the programming language Dart but it also includes many other packages and tools. For example, this Object D CLI that can generate projects and has multiple build features, also generating directly zips. Today, I want to show you in detail what this is and how you can use it yourself. First things first, of course, you can see this is a long video, so feel free to skip to the portion you need. I'll talk a bit about how this project came to be, what it is, and also at the very end, there is a guide to install Object D and try it for yourself. Also know in the beginning, of course, I won't cover everything in this very video, but there's an entire playlist link below. I also urge you to go to objectd.stevetus.com for the full documentation and more examples. If you jump a bit back in time, I'm about to create a few complex data packs that interact with each other, reuse components in itself and generally require a bit of hard coding <laughs> like you can see here in this dump example. Well, of course, what this does is it summons just 10 armor stands in a row here. Nothing too complicated, right? But if you have this a few dozen times in your data pack, then you notice it is quite tedious to write this out. And to be honest, these commands here are earned beautiful to look at, especially if you start nesting it with execute and other conditions and so on. 2018 my solution was, well, I'm gonna write a programming language that makes the structure of MC functions a bit better. So, so you actually have nesting, you can work with the variables a bit better and so on. Well, it turns out for small data packs, this works very great. But for the complex ones I tried to create, it is still difficult to use and it was hard to add new features to it. That's why I tried a modular approach. So similar to the data packs I wanted to, I wanted to create with modules to swap out and swap in, so should be the tool to develop these data packs. Instead of making a completely new programming language, this is done in an existing programming language, namely Dart. So to create the same thing in Object D, you can see I already defined a function here. We'll see how this works in more detail soon. But basically here, we can now write our commands. And I already spoiled it a bit that this is all about nesting. So you can see this is a list of widgets here. And one of these widgets is the for widget. What this simply does is we can say from zero to nine, for example, we want to create, we want to create a certain thing. For our case, this would be the armor stands. So we can simply say create, and then we get this index here. What this will do is go from zero to nine, pass the index to us, and then we can say, we want an armor stand here. And of course, object D <laughs> tells us what it wants. Of course, to summon an armor stand, we need a location to summon it at. So in here, we also have a location object that we say relative. And then we can just say X should be our I. <laughs> and of course, Dart has types and a relative and a relative position can also have decimal places. So we need to say to double here because i is an integer, it just counts from zero to nine. So we make this a bit more beautiful by adding commas right here. So it formats it beautifully. And this is the basics to create 10 armor stands. We don't have to say armor stand 10 times. We just use this counter here that generates our armor stand 10 times. We can just run the entire project here and you can see we have our 10 commands here. Of course, previously we also had the names. Of course, we can also provide it here. And you can see it expects a text component. 
this is also this is also a bit tricky in usual functions where you always have these JSON things. But here you can just say text component and then simply the text you want. You can also see here there are multiple other properties that you can all use in your text components. Set the color for example. And this is pretty easy with this hover documentation here. But for now we just want to say this should have the number i. With with this dollar sign you can simply substitute the dart variable into the string here. And of course we also want it to be visible, so we'll just say name visible to true. Of course you don't have to remember remember all these properties here that you can set on an arm stand, there are a ton. You can either look in the documentation link below or you can at least in VS Code you can just hover over this widget right here and see all the properties, their types and mostly also a bit about documentation down below. So now it is generated here and you can see this is pretty much what we had before. <laughs> again, again, please don't question why I picked this example but I think it is quite nice to look at in object D. And of course you can even extend this to much more. So if you say we have a pose here, there's an extra object for that. And we can, for example, set the head rotation. And of course it goes from minus 180 to 180. So in this scenario, we can also make that dependent on the eye that we created. So the number of the armor stand we have. So let's see, we have the eye from zero to nine. We want to go up to minus 180 and because this is the lower bound we have to multiply our i by 360. Of course this here thinks that i is running between 0 and 1 so we additionally divide by 9 to get a 1 when the the i value is 9 here. So here we see the generated result and it goes from minus 180 to 180 as expected. You can also see Object D is smart enough to extend this to three coordinates as needed by Minecraft. And here we just had one. It basically, it basically assumes both the other ones are zero. So here we are back in Minecraft and let's summon our armor stands again. <laughs> and we can see the head positions are a bit crazy here. But of course this is exactly what we wanted with the great advantage that we can change these variables here. So let's say we want to make this dependent on some variable n. And let's set this to 100. And, and just to be clear, this tool object D is mostly a markup tool. So this variable here is actually in the program language Dart and it will not be translated into a variable in Minecraft or any fancy compiler things, but with this, we just say we want to go from zero to n and generate, yeah, well, 100 commands. So of course we also have to change the nine right here, divide by n there, and that's it. Now we can set with a variable how many armor stands we want to have, and we can even change our source code, which is not that simple in this huge MC function file right here. Let's say we want to have numero i here. We can just simply do that. And, it's, and it is perfectly reflected in the data pack. What you can also do with the for widget is provide a list. So let's go down here. And therefore we just write for dot off. And then we can provide a list of another widgets that we want to include. So in this way you can kind of customize how these things here are generated or just execute multiple widgets which are then nested inside of one widget or dot off here. And then maybe a comment. And of course these commands will be generated in a sequence. And down here we can see these commands here. But let's remove that again. Of course you may say, well, we don't need 100 armor stands that often in Minecraft in a row. And yes, that's true. This was just a simple example, but I want to show you a few things with scoreboards, which is obviously much more useful. So in Object D, there are two distinct types for scoreboards. 
One is the scoreboard. So we just define our score as a scoreboard here and give it a name. Let's call it test score. And if we were to include it just inside this array here, it would just simply generate our scoreboard right here. So scoreboard add and then the name and so on. Also see the type here is by default dummy, but of course you can change it as well as the display. But the notion of a score really becomes interesting. That is basically a scoreboard name and an entity. So let's also define this as a variable here. We call it S and you can go ahead and define it as a score and you can see it takes an entity and a score. An entity is a bit tedious in object D. You have to write entity and then you have all these things as seen before. This is really similar with all of the objects in object D. But we want to have the entity.self here. So basically at S, this just selects the entity that executes this function. And then we have our test score again. So this is one way to define the score here. And notice here is also the property add new. So if we were to add the score inside of here, it would also add a new scoreboard. But not at this location here, but in the load function. If I scroll up a bit here, here I already defined a pack and also which function it should add into the, and also which function should be loaded when reloading or enabling the data pack first. I simply define this function here as load and this should be for now be an empty array, of course, which with widgets and sites. Uh, I also have to include it right here so that it actually registers, registers in our pack. This is by the way, then also the namespace. And like that, we get a load.mc function here. And you can see I spoiled it already. This test score is now here in the load function and not in the summon MC function here, as you would expect. <laughs> well, that is an optimization feature by object D because scoreboards only have to be initiated once. And that is done in the load.mc function. And not every time you execute the summon.mc function or even worse, the tick function. But because we already have the, our scoreboard here, we can also write this a bit cleaner. We just copy this one here and then we take our scoreboard and just apply our entity in the square brackets here. So we kind of select our entity from our scoreboard. So we have seen adding this score here just to the function doesn't really do anything, just adds the scoreboard. But of course you can do many uh, operations on a score and these are accessible by the dot in Dart. And here you can see there are a few methods for adding things, adding a score, divide by a score, checking if it's bigger, if it's smaller, if it matches some, something. But of course, writing these things down is also a bit tedious. So you can simply use this symbol right here to assign a new value to a score. Well, and this basically translates into this right here, which is of course a bit more to write than just S should be the new value zero. By the way, I, I'm going to change this to five here so we don't have many commands. And of course you can also add a number, let's say S plus five. And also with the same operator, you can also add another scoreboard. So let's say we have a scoreboard entity dot all, just selects all players. And of course, and of object D generates these two commands here, add, and then also the operation command, which, which takes the other score from at A. And of course, the same is also available for multiplication, dividing, modulo, and so on. Of course, assign also works with other scores. But now you actually want to check for a value in a scoreboard. So of course, there is a widget for that. It's the if widget. And here again, you can see the concept of nesting. We have a property here called then, and this again accepts a list of new widgets. So we can execute widgets inside of this widget. Object D also adds a or else here, and then a few other things here. 
which are not that re relevant right, right now. But of course, we need a condition. And here we just want to check if our score matches a certain value. So let's say if the score is three, yes, this symbol here should represent a, a equal. But now we can say then provide a new list here inside of the other list. And then for example, say a log message, hello, which is also added by object D and simply translates into this tail raw command here with a bit of formatting. But you can see it generates this execute command here, which matches the score to three. Of course, we could also have used a greater than sign here, which would, which would basically make this a range here going on from four. There's also less and less equal than and so on. <laughs> so this is quite intuitive to check for a scoreboard. I would say this here is a bit more complicated, definitely more to write. So, so you might be surprised that this then thing here is a list and not just one command like it is here. But object D actually provides you with something called prefixing. So what you can see here, this execute command is a prefix of this other command. Object D keeps track of these prefixes and inserts them when necessary. So if we were to add another widget right here, so for, for example, s plus one, it would just generate another execute if here and execute our widget. And for optimization reasons, if we have three or more widgets inside of here, we'll just generate a new function here. Inside a new folder called object D and it just will number all of these files here, if one, if two, and so on. And that, is, and that is also these options here that you can set. Once the folder to generate a new file in and then also a file name, if you aren't happy with if one. For now, this only applies to the direct children. So if we were to add our four here from before with generating the armor stands, this still counts as two widgets here and we would still expand them like usual, but of course prefix all the, all the commands we have here, <laughs> which would be pretty tedious to be honest. So there is one interesting thing about this if widget, we can also provide an or else. Of course, for this simple condition here, <laughs> it is pretty simple to determine what is the negated con condition here. But let's see what object D makes out of this. Well, there are a few more commands now. And what object D basically does is it adds a tag to an entity. The entity being here at S. And then it ch just checks if this tag is present on all the entities. And also <laughs> if the tag is not present on all one entity. And that is the else block. Why is it that complicated and not just generating another execute if? Well, you can actually use a number of conditions here in the execute if. So there is the condition object right here. And you can see there are a number of things that you can use. Of course, the score we already saw, and we also have a shorter way of doing it. But the interesting being the and, not and or. Maybe the or is the most interesting. And here again, we can provide a list of another conditions. So we have our one condition here, and we can also say or s equals 10, for example. And how this is done is it just adds the tags for both of these conditions. Now the cool thing being, because again, this can be a list of anything here, we can also nest these conditions. So let's say we have another condition dot and, and there we have our s is equal to 10. And maybe we use another condition, condition dot not, which simply negates the condition inside of here. And then we can use condition dot data, for example, which requires a data widget, especially the data dot get widget. And here again, we can provide a location, we can provide an entity, and then we also have to provide a, a path to check whether this data is there. 
So let's go with the location and this time maybe a global location. By default, this will just be zero and then the path being, I don't know, item zero or something like that. So this here is still a string because you can access arbitrary NBT data. So once again, let's take a look here. Pretty complicated ones. And of course the end condition is just translated into two following conditions and the not is translated to unless. But of course with this nesting here, it is a bit more clear what this code here does. Although I have to admit, this is also pretty congested here. And of course, again, you can make these conditions behave differently depending on a variable in or some input you give it and then dynamically generate ifs. Of course, another command you need pretty often is the execute command. There's an implementation here and you can already see there are a few subconstructors here for all the different things you may want. And of course, this acts pretty similar to the if widget. We can provide it some, we can provide it some arguments here and then also give it a children argument where you can list a few more widgets that should be executed. So let's choose an entity here and maybe also look a bit more into this object here because this is a quite long thing here and, and you can find everything that you have in vanilla Minecraft. So for example, to provide some tags, we can simply write tags and then list all the tags we want to have. Again, this has to be a string here. So sadly a bit more to write, but because we are still in Dart, we can also define this as a variable. Let's define a tag here, test. And then we can also insert this here inside of here. And, and in a second, we will also see how to use this variable even more. Again, here you can check for scores, but we can also check for a distance and this needs a range. And the default range here has a from and to, but of course you can also go just to some value here or from a value and accept everything below that. So let's do two and choose a distance of five here. I won't do anything more with the entity here. Again, you can look at the documentation to see all the parameters, but we want to go into these children here. And in this case, if we just include the T here, this is equivalent to adding the tag to the entity. So here you can see it generated this execute command also, also with the add s directly, and then it just adds the tag. Of course, it defaulted to add s here, but you can also change it in this tag. Here you can provide an optional entity. But of course, in this case, we want to have add s actually. To remove it, we just say dot remove or remove if exists, and then also checks if the tag exists and optionally executes another widget here. But of course, we already, already checked if the tag exists. Then there's also toggle toggles the tag from one state to another. And if you would like to check for a tag that is not existent, we can also say here where we have the tag, tag dot not. And here you can now see the entire logic for the toggle. Of course, these are a few more commands because it adds an intermediate tag. If this is existent, it removes the tag. And if not, it adds the tag again. But you can also see the tag is now here not test. So this also works. Another way to check if it if something is not present is just to take this entity object here and then have a not function on there. And then you can also do all the other th things here and also provide some tags and so on. The object G joins these two conditions here seamlessly. Another thing which is a bit special is uh, chaining execute commands. There you go just to the very end of this execute widget. And then you can say dot and, and do a lot of things here. For example, you can center this entire thing, which will, which will position the execution in the center of, of a block. And you can also say the Y coordinate here. So you can move it up or down. And then again, you can say again, dot and do some other things here. You have some store things here, but there, but there's actually a better way to do this. But let's say we want to use the dimension here again, then we can just say dimension dot the end overworld nether and so on. This is auto completed here. 
And here you can see it generated this align and position thing and also the in command here. I already hinted it. The execute store thing is a bit extra. Of course, you can still do that with the dot notation here. But I figured out, well, if we store th something, we want to get it somewhere and then save it somewhere else. And why not do this directly on the objects responsible for it? So if we have the score here, then we can just call a method on it, set to data, for example, or also set to result or set to condition. There's also set to widget. This is a bit experimental because this widget inside of there just has to generate exactly one command. Of course, you can't store multiple commands in there, but the thing you are most likely to use is set to data, which again needs a data.get. So let's just copy this up here. And here you can see beautifully the score here is the thing we want to write to. And then we provide the thing we want to get the data from. I think this is, I think this is much cleaner than using some execute command and providing two things and, and we don't really know where the data is coming from and where we are storing it. Of course, this also works with data a bit differently. There we have just data from score. And then again, we have to provide the target, the path, uh, and uh, of course the score. But I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Data.modify works similarly with the exception that we can choose from multiple modifiers here. So we have append, insert, and so on. And there, and there we can provide a dynamic value. So for example, also a score. But again, I hope this is pretty clear in the doc documentation. Another thing you may want to use is the storage. So let's define a new variable for that. Let's call it store is a new storage. Let's give it a name store. And then you can also use in set to data here the storage. Of course, of course, a storage is not 100% the, the same as data, but we can just say dot to data and then it will generate a, a data widget for us. I kind of forgot we also need a path for that. So we have the get method here. And of course here we just provide the key. So let's say test data. The reason why there is this extra widget here storage is because of the following. Also notice object D generated a new function here, execute one, because at this long execute command here, we now have three widgets. This works the same with the if. And here we now have all the commands that we want to execute. Of course, now without a prefix. And here you can also see the data storage command and also the reason why there is an extra widget for that. We of course need a namespace of the data pack before and object D handles that for you in this storage widget and automatically inserts the namespace we defined up here. This is by the way also the case if we define new files. So let's do that in the or else here. We can just say file.execute, provide a path where we want to generate a new file. Let's say path slash else. This always goes from the function path here. And then we can also provide it a child. And let's use a comment widget here, which will just translate to a comment in the MC functions. Format that beautifully with the comma here. And let's see what object E does. As we expected, it generated a new folder here and then an else MC function with a comment inside. One thing you can also do with files is provide a header. This assures that this comment is always at the top. So for example, in the load function, we have seen there are a few things that are generated there. And by providing this header here, you can assure that this comment will stay on top. You can, for example, say who the author is or so, and so on. And of course we have an extra constructor for that dot file header. There we can just give it a description and optionally also an author call from and some optional context. Let's just call this else file. And let's also say the author is Stevatus. And then we have this entire fancy section up here that gives a bit of context <laughs> to what this file does and why it is here. You can, you can also set global options here for the author and so on, but I won't get into that very much. So I think you got a pretty good overview what object D does, how to structure these things. Of course, you can also add 
Dart comments in here to give a bit of context and make this code a bit more readable. And this here is pretty much nonsense, nonsense so it so it doesn't do anything. But of course, at Spoilert, we will also look at a real project and see how this is done. For now, I want to speak a bit more behind the scenes. We have already seen with this notation here, add func, and then define a variable like this. We can add a new function. Of course, we have to register this function up here, which is just the name we give it, and then file appended to it. And the entire time, we basically looked at this pack right here, which generates this namespace here, shop slash m functions. And this is the way to define this package here. <laughs> but there's one file in the generated project that we didn't take a look at yet. And that is the index.dart here. And this is basically the entry point of the object D project. Here you tell, tell Dart how to generate and where to generate it. So here we have a familiar notation at project. We tell it a name. This is basically the name of the folder here, of the data pack folder, and also a target. If it was this here, it would just generate it inside of this project folder here. But of course we want to have it outside. <laughs> I said it like this. But of course you can also set the version here. By default right now it is version 18, which stands for Minecraft 1.18. And Object D is actually so smart that it adapts certain commands to the specific versions. The most recent thing I, wa I think was the new item command. In Object D we still have the replace item widget, just because the item is already used here as a structure to describe an item. But this of course generates an item command for Minecraft 1.18 and still in replace item command for Mi Minecraft 1.16 in case anyone is using this. Maybe I could also say a few words about this item here. Here we also have basically anything you expect, a name, you can give it some NBT data, but most importantly you can say, set it a type and a count. And Object D actually has all the Minecraft items built in, so you have uh, auto completion here. So let's say we want to have an apple. And then of course we also have to give it a slot. There we again we also have auto completion, ender chest, container, hotbar, all the inventories. And we also have a, a few D functions here. So for example for the inventory we can provide a row and a column here. So like it, like it is described here. If we want to have it in a row two and in the column three, we can just say this here and it will translate it to inventory.14 so we don't have to rem remember these things. All over object D there are these small helpers here that get you around creating data packs a bit more conveniently. Enough of that, we talked about the version here. And you can also give a description for the pack.mcmeta file here. So this is pretty easy. And then there is one option here that might be a bit weird. And now we really dive deep into the core of object D. As you may have noticed, it generates a few other files here on the side, mainly the g.dart files here. And this is actually the code generation part of object D. As you may have guessed, add signs here are just some abbreviations to create things faster and easier with these variables here. Originally, this was also based on this nesting behavior that I think I talked a lot about. So here, the index g.dart, there it actually generates a main function that is executed by dart. And this main function again calls the create project function, which will actually create all the folders here and compile all the widgets and create the files. And this then uses the project widget, which is generated by this, by this code generation with all the parameters you want to have it. And then we also have arguments. So you can also set a few options when you call object D. But most importantly, this project widget here has also a generate widget. And this will basically take any widget you have. So for, for example, 4.off and first it searches for any packs that are given in your project. Of course, starter here is already a pack, mainly the pack we defined with a variable here. 
this just creates in an instance of the shop pack. And again, the shop pack is defined in this g.dart here. This is again code generation from our shop pack.dart to make things a bit more easy. And here we actually have the code to write a new widget. It just extends this widget here. And then we have to give it a method generate that again gives a widget back. In this case, it's just a pack widget. But of course, all the things we want to have, it says we want to have a main and a load function. But basically this is done for you. You don't have to care about this. But at this point, I just want to give a brief overview. And of course, you can also write this style here, writing a project, then nest a pack widget here with all of these options here, and then nest again files in that and so on, like you've seen before. And here above, we can also see these identifiers we used here are just some variables defined here to make things a bit more easy to define the file widget here to create it and then also append some widgets to it. This shouldn't be a big deal. But of course, this advantage with the nesting and so on is that every widget knows which is parent. If some parent is, for example, a pack, you can get the namespace from that and we don't have to write this. For example, in the case of the storage widget, we don't have to write the namespace for it. And as I said, pack is just a usual widget, so we can also use it inside of your code. I guess this is not that commonly used, but you can do it. So for example, let's define another pack here, a test pack, and provide a main file, which will just be file, let's call it main. And let's have a child which just logs main file. And now here on the side, you can see there is a new folder here inside of the data folder. And there we have a main.mc function with the terror command and also the tick.json here as registered as we expect. So you can do the things here. I don't know, maybe there's a use case for that. But of course you can generate multiple packs with multiple namespaces and have them work together and use the same widgets and so on. Talking of about widgets, I actually didn't tell you this yet. You can also define a widget with this short notation here at widget. So in case you need something you want to reuse all the time, let's say, let's say the armor stand here from the beginning, let's copy all of this. And a widget you can see like a usual function in any programming language. It returns, of course, a widget. Then we have to give it a name, row, armor stand, for example, <laughs> let's say like that. And then in Dart, you can either just say return armor stand or also using the short hand notation with this arrow here, you can save a few characters. So of course this armor stand now needs the variable i and we can just provide this as an argument. So let's say it gets an integer i and then everything should work out, I think. Of course, we can also give it a few more arguments. We want to have an optional argument of type string, a name, and of course default should be numero here. Oh, I actually misspelled that before. But of course now we can just replace that with name and now we can even set the name dy dynamically, however you want to have this. And let's say we want to have a Boolean option here, rotate head. This should also be true by default. Let's format that a bit. If rotate head is false, we don't want to have this pose here. So we just use this shorthand if notation. So we check is rotate head true, then use a pose, or else we just say null, which is nothing in this case. So there won't be any pose set for the armor stand. So after the code generation is done, we can again look into the shop pack to g.dart. And up here we have a new section, which actually creates a class for you named row armor stand, like we wanted to have it and it extends this widget as we have seen below. But it gives you also a few properties here, creates a constructor for you, and then generates the widget by using the original function you wrote a minute ago. Well, now you might say, 
why do I even need this complex widget here to just reassemble the functionality I wrote in my function here? There are actually quite a few things you can do with this. Well, for once, because this is a normal class like you're used to in programming languages, you can define additional variables that hold actual state across multiple widgets or inside a single widget and then also define some functions on this class. So for example, like we've seen in the execute widget, let's say we have a change name method here and then you could configure it in a way that it changes the name or even returns a new widget that uses the data widget for example internally to actually change the name of the armor stand you just summoned. Another thing I want to point out is this context here. You can also actually use it inside of this notation here. Just write context, context, and then it will use this variable here actually and not generate a new one. Oh yeah, maybe I shouldn't do this optionally, but inside of here. And now you can see this is not a variable that you can input in the widget, but it actually uses this variable here from the context. The code generator will notice this. And if we take a look inside of this object right here, this is actually the thing that powers all these prefixes, uh, the namespaces and so on that all widgets know about it. You can just press F12 in VS Code and then you actually see the source code. So we have so we have prefixes and suffixes. This can be added by the group widget and the context keeps, keeps track of them as it goes deeper and deeper into the widgets. Then we have an option whether this is compiled in production mode. So you can directly export an zip file from object D and then maybe exclude debug messages, comments and so on. So it is a bit tidied up. The pack ID is basically the namespace. As you can see here, that is used inside of a command and it just generates a function, uses this pack ID and then also the load file, which is the next thing actually we do get the path of the load file and main file in case we provided some. And we actually get also the path of the current file we are in. So we can actually do stuff depending on in which function am I, what file I, am I generating and then do this dynamically. <laughs> and maybe the most important one that is that might help you a lot is this version tag here. This is always set to the current Minecraft version. So by default it is 18 here for Minecraft 1.18. We have already seen that in the project and this gets also passed down to the widgets and you can generate depending on the version. So if you want to support different Minecraft versions, snapshots and so on and want to generate multiple data packs on the spot, you can do that pretty easily. And then we have some internal stuff here that you don't have to care about. So you see behind this simple keyword widget here and all of these functions here, there's quite a bit going on. I hope this brief explanation helped a bit. Of course, these widgets are mostly used internally. Actually, everything that you use has exactly this structure here and also in external libraries. So one thing I, I made with this is object D GUI. This basically gives you capability to define GUI in object D using these GUI pages, GUI module. These are all widgets and hide a bit the complexity behind it and make it a nice interface so you can define some actions, some clickable items, different pages and so on. So this is really versatile and I'm always grateful if someone creates something with object D that others can use. By the way, you can also turn object D into a website. There is a JavaScript compiler I did this for the GUI thing, for example. Here you can select all the actions and so on. And basically it's the same thing as you seen a second ago. It just defines some widgets and then generates a data pack from it. This is possible if you're interested into going the web direction. There's also documentation on that.
Of course, this video can't cover everything, but I think it gives a good head start. And together with the documentation, you can start building your things and try out Object D for yourself. Speaking of that, how do you actually install Object D? Sadly, it's not that easy, but I want to step you through the process. And if you have questions or problems, you can reach out to me. So of course, for Object D, you need the Dart programming language. If you've worked with Dart before or with Flutter, you don't need this. But here on dart.dev, I will also link it in the description. You go to get Dart SDK. I will only show this for Windows here, but of course Linux and macOS is similar. And the best way right now to install Dart is using Chocolaty. So we can click on that. And this here is basically a package manager that downloads and installs everything for Dart for you. And here you basically want to click on get started. And then basically we have this one script here. So open your command prompt. And important is that you execute this as administrator. So here we go, I've opened my terminal and you basically want to copy this command here. And this will run the install script for Chocolaty. I already have that installed, but now you can check if Chocolaty is installed by just typing, typing Choco. And it should say the current version. If you see an error message, try refresh env and type Choco again and then Maybe it works. Or you can also restart your command prompt and see if it works then. And then back on the Dart website, you can see this command here. This installs the Dart programming language. So you go in here, run choco install Dart SDK. It will ask you a few questions if it is allowed to run scripts. Of course it is. So you type yes. And in the end, it should say software installed to see tools. And hopefully now the Dart command should be available. This should be what appears here. Of course, you know the trick, refresh end if something doesn't quite work. Okay, now we have Dart. And with this, we can go on to installing Object D. You can go to CLI here, and there's also the command to install this CLI. What is also important to run Object D, you're not required to use this command line interface, but it certainly helps getting started. So here you want to ru run the command you just copied, dart pub global activate object D CLI, and this downloads all the packages you need. And then we basically have our CLI installed. Now you can run dart pub global run object D CLI, and this hopefully should give you this help menu here from the object D CLI. So for example, we can now write global run object D CLI run, and this will run the project. And here it also gives his hints what it needs and so on. But of course, <laughs> this is a pretty long command here and you can also make it a bit shorter by adding object D to your path and windows. This is mostly the thing people get confused about. So just so you know, you can also use this command and it will work perfectly fine. But if you want to type just object D, like I have, I have it here, you can go to your Windows search and search path. Or for me, of course, this is in German. And right here you go onto path. Then you should already see this entire list here. Of course, I've blacked out a lot of things here. But you basically say new and then paste this thing here from the description or you just type it. And this will ensure that all the binaries here are added to the terminal. Basically say OK, OK, and then we're good to go. Again, a refresh env could be helpful here. And then you can try typing object D. <laughs> Windows is a bit special there. So maybe you have to close your terminal and open it again for it to be available. Or you even have to restart your entire computer. But eventually, if you've done everything right until this point, Object D should be available here. All right, now we are good to go creating our first project with the CLI. And therefore you just type dart pub global run object D CLI and then new. Of course, as I've explained this, if you do have this handy way of just saying object D, 
You can also do this, but everything following after that is exactly the same. So this will also work with the more lengthy version. We have to provide a folder name. I will just call this example and then the CLI is setting up the project. It will also ask us a few questions. As you notice, this is kind of in the middle of the program here. And it asks for the data pack name. Well, maybe we just want to call it example data pack, and then we can press enter and it will ask us the next question here and set up the things behind the scenes. Well, the namespace example sounds good. So we just press enter and this will accept the default that's, that is in these brackets here. So then we can select a project template. Likely in the future there are a few more, but for now I can choose from these three here. The click template is using a carrot on a stick module and counting a few things. Then classic is the bare bones object D project where this rather old nesting style comes in play. And I would always suggest you start with basic. This is with these add annotations that I hope is easiest to start with. So we will just select one. Of course, this is also the default here, but you can also type it in. Then it also asks for the target Minecraft version. We'll put 19 here for Minecraft 1.19, and it will also just insert it into the project. So now you should read cloning project. And it should also have created a few files here. One thing here, this project is loaded from GitHub. So you need to have an internet connection to download all these files. So now we can go into example and then open VS code. Of course, you can also use any other code editor. So if you do have some warnings here, like I have, go back into the terminal and run dart pub get and this should download all the things you need so before we proceed go to extensions and make sure you have dart installed this makes your life way easier and has many features that object D relies on we still see errors here and of course this is related to these annotations here and code generation so it says index.g.dart has not been generated and we should run the generator. This is also pretty easy. Jumping back into the terminal, we can now say dart run build underscore runner, and then just say build as command. This will take a few seconds, but eventually it should generate some things here. And after a few seconds, it should succeed. And now in the editor, you should be able to see the g.dart files and the error should be gone. I also recommend to run this in the background. You can do this by setting build runner watch here. And then it will just watch all your files and see if you changed anything. And then you don't have to worry about it. I will also open another terminal here. So in one terminal, we now have this build runner here. And in the other terminal, we can now run object D. This should be, this should be relatively easy. You just say object D run, and then the path of the index file here. So in our case, this is in lib and then index.dart. So we just say lib index.dart. And then it says how much time it took. And of, and of course, you can also do this without the object D CLI. You just say dart lib and then index.dart. So however, some options might not be available. You can also type object D help. And then you see all the options you have. Of course, we have seen new here. We have seen run. And there you can also append some things here. For example, there is the dash dash gen option, and this will basically run all of this here before it runs object D. But, but for now, I would not recommend it because this makes things a bit, a bit slower than running things 
in parallel right here. Here we can also set the flag production mode and this basically makes it ready for publishing and creates a zip file. The CLI also has another feature called surf. This is similar to the watch that we have already running. So we can say surf lib index.dart and then it will watch your files basically and generate the data pack only if changes occur. So let's actually jump back into the editor and look what this template here looks, looks like. Of course, there might be minor changes in the future, so you might not have exactly the same thing, but it should be relatively similar. We have our project annotation creating the project, and like we wanted, it should be called example data pack. As we ran object D earlier, this also should be generated here. And we should have a, a good to go data pack. You also should see a pack here and I've created an extra folder for that where your pack is stored. And there you have this pack annotations here, including already a tick file and a load file that are defined below here. So this is basically the thing we started with an hour ago. And now if we go in here and change something, let's log hello world, then you should see in the console file change detected. And it should, should also just generate the functions that have, have been changed. That's basically it. Now we have object D running. In the background, the data pack will be generated automatically if you save. And of course, it's a completely valid data pack and you can load it into Minecraft. Object D will do all the validation. So to stop the entire process here, either, either you close your terminal or you press Ctrl C and then say yes. So I really hope this video helped you getting started with Object D. Of course, this is just the beginning of the journey, but now you can create data packs and play around with Object D a bit. In case you want to go deeper, what I assume as you made it this far, you can click around my channel. There you find a ton of videos about Object D, useful tips, all the widgets explained, and much more. I will also link the playlist here. Also, in case you encountered any problems, in the description there's also a Discord link, and you can ask questions here, or I or another helpful person should be able to respond in the matter of hours. Also, in case you detect any issues or bugs, you can go to the GitHub page and create issues here, there. And I'm also grateful for discussions here on the GitHub page. Okay, that's been it. I appreciate anyone trying Object D. Have a wild ride and we'll see us in another video.